We're continuing our series on vaccines with support from the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. Last week, we talked about the immune system, how it responds to pathogens, and how vaccines are an exploitation of that response. This week and next, we're covering the history of vaccine resistance, including backlash from the public, incidents associated with vaccination, and debunked issues that somehow continue to gain traction despite a complete lack of evidence. There's so much that we're going to need two episodes to get through it, but starting it is the topic of this week's healthcare triage. It might seem like the anti vax movement is a relatively modern one, but societal pushback against vaccination has been going on pretty much since vaccines were invented. In 1721, Cotton Mather, a major player in bringing smallpox inoculation to the Americas, didn't have a lot of fans. According to historical records, a primitive grenade was thrown through his window with a note attached to it that said, and I'm quoting, Cotton Mather, you dog, damn you. I'll inoculate you with this, with a pox to you. Mather later wrote about this, saying, I never saw the devil so let loose upon any occasion. When one medical journal announced their support in 1903 for compulsory vaccinations, they received an avalanche of letters from very angry vaccine opponents. One such letter was from a doctor in New York demanding his subscription be canceled. This demand was accompanied by the statement, and I'm quoting, Oh, bosh! Take a boy and scratch him all over with a nail and then roll him in the mud and I will guarantee that no harm will come from it as long as that nasty, rottenness, poisonous matter is kept out of the abrasions. Other detractors compared compulsory vaccination laws to the command of King Herod to kill all male children under the age of two. Long story short, Vaccination-related passions have always run hot. And even back in the days of yore, a piece of the pushback against vaccines had to do with government regulation. In England, public health policies were seen by some as an assault on working-class communities by the ruling class, with anti-vaccine groups being reportedly composed largely of laborers, small shopkeepers, and the like, with their greatest support concentrated in working-class areas. It was claimed that middle-class citizens who refused mandatory vaccinations were rarely prosecuted, and members of parliament were not forced to vaccinate their children if they didn't want to, while working-class people were held to a different standard, perhaps because they were thought to be the conduits of disease. Potentially unsavory reasons aside, people don't often like to be told what to do regardless of the reason. When the government requires something like seatbelts or vaccinations to safeguard public health, it's viewed by some as an affront to individual freedoms and by others as necessary for the overall good. The push and pull can be seen in the history books. Doctors in the 1800s who believed in the efficacy of vaccination nevertheless spoke out against it being compulsory for reasons of basic human rights. Others asserted that if God had not wanted people to be vaccinated, he would have vaccinated them. Though this argument's particularly weak, considering that humans regularly build tools with which they were not born, but are still often quite handy. In 1805, Marianne Eliza of Lucca, Napoleon's sister, was the first ruler to try and make vaccination compulsory, but she was unable to because she couldn't find a practical way to force people to do it. The British Vaccination Act of 1853 made smallpox vaccination mandatory for children during the first three months of life, with parents subject to fines or imprisonment for noncompliance. In 1898, a new act was passed that included a conscience clause, allowing vaccination exemptions for parents who did not believe the vaccines were safe and or effective. In 1902, Cambridge, Massachusetts ordered vaccination in response to a smallpox outbreak, and Henning Jacobson, a pastor in Cambridge, refused for both himself and his son on the grounds that they'd had bad reactions to previous vaccines. As a result, he was fined $5, which translates today to about $100. Jacobson objected on the grounds that his personal liberty was being violated and the case eventually worked its way to the United States Supreme Court, where, in 1905, the court upheld the constitutionality of mandatory vaccinations by states. They determined that states had the authority to legislate all matters within their geographic boundaries, including the passage of laws that promoted health, peace, morals, education, and good order of the people. By 1922, many U.S. schools required smallpox vaccination in order for children to attend. Another anti-vaccine sentiment seen today that is echoes in history is the follow the money argument. Pharmaceutical companies are seen by many as profit-driven and therefore inherently untrustworthy, their vaccines included. 
Literature pointing to the money made by physicians and large corporations by a vaccination of the poor existed even in the early 1900s. As a side note, we acknowledge that profit motive can sometimes lead to corruption. We're just saying that, profit issues aside, the evidence for the safety and benefit of vaccines still stands up to scrutiny. But again, I digress. While diphtheria and many other childhood illnesses would eventually be eradicated in the United States via immunization, the resistance was real. In 1926, a group of health officers came to Georgetown, Delaware to vaccinate the townspeople. An armed mob led by a retired army lieutenant and a city councilman forced them out and prevented the vaccination attempt. Interestingly, many anti-vaccination advocates of the 1850s were independent physicians. One of these was a physician in New Orleans who worked hard through a yellow fever epidemic, was a leading surgeon in the city, and was the first to adopt Joseph Lister's antiseptic techniques in his wards. However, he also called for a return of bloodletting, the practice of withdrawing blood from people to treat illnesses, so there's that. Working alone, such individuals didn't have much influence given that the majority of the medical establishment firmly supported vaccination. However, these individuals began to organize and exert greater effects on public opinion. A small group of physicians led by a British anti-vaccine advocate founded the Anti-Vaccination Society of America in 1879. By 1900, several U.S. anti-vaccination societies were founded. Associations like the American Medical Liberty League, founded in 1918, opposed vaccination. Keep in mind here that they also opposed other public health measures like medical licensing and isolating contagious diseases. Also good to keep in mind is that the largest group of physicians working to oppose such measures were homeopaths, proponents of alternative medicine that has yet to be backed up by reliable evidence. Some of the reasons people distrust vaccines is because sometimes bad things happen around the time of vaccination and thus vaccines get blamed for those bad things. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. That's the topic in next week's Healthcare Triage. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You'd enjoy the entire series on vaccinations. Go watch it. We've got a playlist. Also, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. Like the video, too. You could also consider going on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help support the show make great series like this. We'd especially like to thank our research associate, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chen, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.